Females in Food, Chelsea here. I am so excited to be joined today by the founder of Trade Street Jam Company, Ashley Rouse. Hi and welcome, Ashley. Hi, how are you? I am very, very well and I feel really privileged to be uh, with you today. You're a very busy woman. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm going to jump straight in. You started your business in your Brooklyn kitchen and recently you surpassed $70,000 in sales and you quit your day job. Firstly, congratulations. And also you've just had a baby. So congratulations. Thank you. Where does most of your sales revenue come from of that 70,000, Ashley? Uh, So the majority of it comes from online. Um, And actually, since we've spoken, um, we have just, our sales have increased so much more than we could have imagined um, in just one year. Uh, Right now, we're at 270,000 or so for this year. So um, we're at record sales right now. That is excellent. And that is primarily pandemic driven yeah mostly um a a big part of it also though is the black lives matter movement which um is a big piece in politics going on right now um and i you know this is something i have said before but it's interesting to me because you know being black isn't new uh being a black business owner isn't new uh and dealing with some of these just racist acts honestly that's the best way to say it racist acts that's not new um and so the fact that this is kind of a um a big trend right now is a little bit disarming I guess when you you know say that it's a trend but again I'm so grateful for the sales so I think a lot of um businesses a lot of people are just really looking to support black businesses right now um in any way that they can and so I I think on top of COVID the Black Lives Matter movement is also a big reason for the sales increase. Okay. So my, it was remiss of me not to ask you to tell me a little bit more about what Trade Street Jam Company actually is. Yeah. So we are a jam company, right? But we make low sugar vegan products, very different than your traditional uh, smuckers or um, things that you'll find on the shelf in the jam aisle. It's all about super clean ingredients, uh, very minimal sugar, um, and, you know, just no ingredients that you can't pronounce, no thickeners, stabilizers, additional um, ingredients in there that you don't need. So it's all about just a very clean, better for you product. Um, And it's also about kind of the different uses, right? So for us, our mission is to really introduce the world to a concept bigger than sugary jam on toast. So of course our jam's great on toast, it's great on bread and biscuits and things like that. But if you wanna use it to make cocktails, you can. If you wanna make a sauce for roasted meats or veggies, you can. Um, so it's, it's really about culinary exploration. And you trained at culinary school, right? So you come in, at, you're very flavor driven. That's correct. So um, I went to Johnson and Wales in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, And yeah, everything for me is just about um, flavor innovation, you know, just being in the test kitchen and mixing and matching all these funky things. You know, if it's something that you've heard of before or that doesn't, you know, kind of shock you, then it's not for me. It has to be something that if I tell you, you go, hmm, what? Or even you might go, I don't know about that. Then I know it's it's the one. Can you give me an example? Yeah, so um, one of our most popular flavors is our strawberry chipotle and fig. Um, it's been around for a few years now, and it remains our number one bestseller. But I think for me, I you know, I wanted a flavor that people could resonate with, so that's the strawberry. Um, you know, fig is a very common, um, you know, partner for, for strawberry. So I wanted to throw some dried figs in there. But then I thought, hmm, what will really kind of take it to the next level? And I thought heat, right? I love a little bit of spice. Um, and then, you know, it was very important, like what kind of heat, right? Jalapenos are very often found in jams. I want to do something different. I immediately thought Chipotle. I love the smokiness to it, the complexity of Chipotle. Um, and I just thought it would be perfect with strawberry and fig. And, uh, literally it is the number one bestseller. So you have a, a jam club. And so does that mean, I want you to tell us what your jam club is, but I imagine 
as a jam club member, you get to have surprise treats that you're not expecting, like what you just mentioned. Is that right? That's right. So um, the Jam of the Month subscription, basically you sign up um, and you can, you know, choose your frequency, but most people choose once a month and uh, you get a new jam shipped to you every month. So you can either log in and choose what flavor it is, um, or you have an option uh, that I call surprise me. And, you know, you can allow us to just ship anything to you. And I just think it's so fun. A lot of our really adventurous uh, customers will just pick that surprise me option um, and they can be shipped, you know, any of our flavors at any time and then any seasonal flavors that'll come up. So right now we have a cranberry, raspberry and sage um, that we released in September for um, for the holiday season. And we did pre-orders and it already sold out. So we'll have to make another uh, round of that and bring it back. But our Jam Crump subscription will get that firsthand, which is great. Already sold out and it doesn't exist yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. That is gold. That is fantastic. So I really wanted to hone in when I had this conversation with you on your financial journey because it's, it's a challenge that virtually every foodpreneur that I speak with is challenged by. So I'm curious if you'd share with with us what's been the hardest part of growing your revenue. Wow, that's such a loaded question. I think there's so many hard parts to it. Um, you know, for us, we have yet to get investment. Um, so we have not had any real outside capital. Um, and so we've been able to grow for four years now without any outside capital. So honestly, when you ask what the hardest part is, it's literally managing a business without outside money coming in. Um, you know, you touched on it before, but you know, how do you market and promote a business without money for marketing and promotions, right? So we haven't ran a ton of ads like most companies have, where a lot of it has been very organic. Um, you know, keeping inventory on the shelves is very, very tough. If, you know, we're an inventory driven business, if we don't have product, we can't sell it, we can't make money. Um, but you need money to produce product. So it's just been a very um, a, a tough game, right, of just kind of moving money around and um, you know, taking some money out of my savings here and then making some money, maybe putting some back in savings, but putting the rest back into the business and then trying to get larger accounts so that our orders, uh, our wholesale orders were instead of 1,000, 2,000, maybe 20 or $50,000 orders. I mean, it, you know, it's a, it's just all a game. Uh, one of the big things I did was um, be able to hire an intern from a company I found where you can get interns for very, very cheap. Um, it's like a three month internship. You pay like 150 bucks. Um, and I use that intern's time to reach out, just reach out to PR companies to get press and reach out to potential wholesale customers. Um, and the best thing about that was that we got a lot of PR um, organically without having to pay for it. Um, and then we got a few like corporate orders, which were a little bit larger. So that kind of helped, you know, perpetuate more business. Interesting that you say that you're an inventory driven enterprise, yet You've pre-sold your, was it blueberry and sage? And there was a third ingredient. The cranberry raspberry sage. But beg your pardon, yeah, cranberry, yeah, raspberry, raspberry sage. Raspberry sage. You've got yeah. to tell us how you did that. So, uh, you know, pre-selling things is not something we've always done. It's something kind of newer for us. Um, but it's a really great way for, especially for, you know, my small businesses out there, it's a really great way to get the money up front. Um, you know, and I'm still learning, right? I didn't know that years ago. Um, but to get the money up front and then also kind of calculate how much you're going to need, right? So there's been so many times in the past where I said, oh, this is going to just be so popular and I'll make, you know, 400 jars. And then I sell 100 right away. And then the other 300, I'm hustling to get sold, you know, um, months into the, the shelf life of it. Um, thank God our product has a year shelf life, but still, you know, you try to get that product moved as quickly as possible. So um, the pre-selling is really, really helpful. So um, 
the cranberry raspberry sage is this is our second year bringing it back it's a, a very fall festive uh, product and uh, yeah we, we put it on pre-order on our website September 1st to ship out October 1st and um, we do a ton of promoting through Instagram so just really a lot of pictures of the jar it's beautiful packaging a lot of pictures of us cooking with it videos of us doing different applications um, and and literally you know it's not even a month maybe two and a half three weeks we've sold um, about 400 jars which is the entire batch we're still small batch which for 300 400 jars is still considered small batch um, and so we'll have to we'll have to make another batch of that before the season's over. That's very exciting, that pre-sale. I mean, in online entrepreneurial land, we talk a lot about that, that you sort of sell it before it even exists. Once you prove the demand, then you can create the product and sell it out. But when you've got an actual product and be inventory driven, as you say, and as obviously food and drink product makers are, that is very difficult. Um, I love that you, you hone in with your marketing with the behind the scenes aspects. So you really take your target customer on the journey with you. Absolutely. So if you did suddenly land a hundred thousand, say in your bank account, what would you do with it? I would hire, uh, I need help with, uh, I need a supply chain manager to, you know, help, uh, manage our co-packer, manage our inventory, um, you know, kind of help with these huge accounts. We've landed a lot of big, big accounts lately, um, such as like Weight Watchers or Nordstrom, which is really, really great for us. Um, but, you know, for me managing everything, it just, it makes my brain mush. Um, so I definitely would hire in that area. Uh, we would put a lot of money towards ads. Uh, like I said, we have grown very organically, which has been fantastic. Um, and so I can only imagine the type of growth we'll see when we put uh, some money consistently behind like Facebook, Instagram ads every single month. Um, so yeah, so hiring and, and uh, advertising would be our, our first two things that we would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, in my coaching program, I talk about a model that I created called function eight, which is about the business building block. So you're really talking about, you know, your marketing and, um, and as you say, I guess, supply chain, or I'd also talk about distribution. Yeah. So keys, the, key, the keys of the sort of front end and the back end of a food and drink business. So I didn't know that you had won Nordstrom's and Weight Watchers. That is massive. So often when, when uh, foodpreneurs do win bigger accounts or for those who have never, and then perhaps watching and listening um, eagerly, hearing and learning from you, there's an assumption that that means more money. But it's all about margin management. So you can get a really big order, but it can, you could be in the red. You know, you might not be making any money from that account. Now, often when you do have big accounts, they, do, they drive down your wholesale price. What can you tell us about that scenario? And has that happened to you in with either of these accounts or other accounts. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting that you bring that up because I, you know, being on the inside, I don't know what things sound like sometimes when I say them and I'll hear people kind of hint at, Oh, you know, I must have a ton of money now. And I, and I think to myself, where are you getting this from? But I, you know, I see now how from the outside you can think that, but no, to your point, um, your margins very, very important. Um, you know, we, we are profitable, which is fantastic. But, you know, if I get a $50,000 order, um, you know, I might only keep 20,000 of that, you know, 30,000 might go to producing that order and getting it shipped out. Um, and even that 20,000, it's not like it goes into my pocket, it goes back into the business so that I can make more product. Um, mm -hmm. So it, definitely the margins are very important um, for a business that sells wholesale kind of finding that sweet spot with your wholesale price is very important. Um, you Could you know, say more so, about that? If I, if I could just interrupt you on that, because that is key, mm -hmm. that sweet spot with your wholesale point. Did you learn the hard way with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. You know, I, uh, our retail price is <clears> 13. Um, and I think, you know, back when we first started, um, some of the bigger stores, the Whole Foods and things like that, you know, wanted to pay three and $4 for our product. 
Um, and it was, you know, very easy for me to say, okay, yeah, I want to get in that store. That's what I'll share. You want $4. Um, and then I really had to sit down, look at my cost, my cost of goods and really factor in everything before I could say, wait a minute, that's how much it costs me to make it. How can I let you buy for that? Um, and so, you know, you, you get to a point where you really have to understand, look, either I'm going to appease these people for this quick money and my business is going to go under in just a short amount of time, or uh, I'm going to have to say no to some people and that's okay. Um, maybe they'll come back around, you know, there, there'll be other opportunities. And I've really had to learn that there's definitely been some people I've had to say no to just because of price point. Um, you know, places like airlines, you know, we've been approached by airlines to have our jams like in, you know, the little food cakes on the food kits on the planes and things like that. Um, and they want, you know, 50,000 jams and you're like, Oh man, that's going to be a huge amount of money for us. But you know, they want the price to be a dollar 50 or something per, per um, item and per unit. And you know, if your cost is $2, <laughs> it's like, it, it makes no sense. So you do have to find that sweet spot. And I say to um, anybody who is working on that, you know, if even if you're not a financial person, you know, get your basic costs down in a spreadsheet. How much does it cost to procure the the ingredients? How much does it cost to get the jars? You know, let's say you're putting something in a jar. How much labor is it costing? Are you producing it or is a co-packer producing it? Then put that labor into it. Um, how much is the, the labeling cost? And then when you have all that down and you can say, okay, my cost is $4.50. Now you can say, okay, how much do I want to make? You can use the industry. Hallelujah. Yeah, like that's literally <laughs> Nobody gets what it boils that down to. That yeah. bit that you just said, Ashley, is like, how much do I want to make? Because there's the costs and then there's your, your, uh, for you, pay for you and your intellectual property and your idea and you running the business and it's your margin as the maker. I've just, it's that honestly is a eureka moment for me that you said that because that's the piece that I think people often, women, food and drink entrepreneurs go to opportunities with stockists or, um, you know, wholesale accounts with the beggar's bowl out take my product but then yeah. they might land that account and they've compromised themselves and they're selling at a loss and what you're teaching them which I just am so excited about is it's like no sometimes it's better for the business for you to say no yeah but most importantly you've got to say yes to you first and, and work out right. your costs and your margin right and a lot of those you know things will change in just a year right so um, you know, a lot of those businesses will come back around and be interested still. Uh, maybe in a year you found better pricing, right? Like we, you know, we have better pricing now on our fruit and our jars and our labels than we did three years ago, of course. Um, and so, th you know, three or four years ago, I tried to get into Whole Foods and they loved the way the product tasted, but they were like, oh, I don't know if it's time and, you know, we don't really need jam right now. And it was always this back and forth. And I was always so upset. Why doesn't Whole Foods have my product? Everybody says it should be in Whole Foods. And we just recently got into Whole Foods. And looking back, I'm thinking three or four years ago, I was not ready to be in Whole Foods, honey. I was not ready. <laughs> like, it's like, look how the world works. Um, I'm so grateful that they did turn us down because I would have uh, taken a price from them where I would have probably ended up losing money. Um, and I, or they would have grown, I would have grown too quickly with them and not been able to keep up because I didn't have my back end operations together. Um, so, you know, patience is key and, and that pricing is very, very important. Um, and if your pricing changes, right, fruit is volatile market. Um, if something's in season, it's going to be a little bit cheaper. If it's out of season, it's going to be more expensive. So, um, something that's a dollar 80 a pound today might be two fifty a pound tomorrow. That matters. Um, especially yeah. with your wholesale pricing. It's very important. So interesting that example, say with the food service, the airline opportunity that, you know, I used to work um, in coffee years ago when we would buy the green beans and they would come into the, the roasting plant where I worked and we roasted for McDonald's and we, it wasn't a branded uh, coffee 
it was McDonald's own brand. But we did our own brand for a whole range of other, um, both in retail and in food service. But we did McDonald's because it bumped up the volume that we could buy from the grower. So, our, it, you know, it was throughput through the factory, basically. It brought down our raw costs. Now, coffee beans have a much longer lifespan than, say, strawberries or blueberries or cranberries or what have you. But did you consider that idea in terms of your buying power if you did take on the airline, for example? Yes, that's uh, that's a great point. Um, and yes, that is something that we are actually considering now and for the future. Um, but I do think, you know, something that's very, very important for small businesses is to not grow too fast, if that makes sense. And I think um, it's a weird concept for people. It's very strange because they're, they're like, oh, no, growth is, it's all about growth, right? And I thought that too. And as I mature and grow in this business, I'm learning more and more that sometimes you can grow too quickly. And so um, for the airlines, yeah, it'll help bring our costs down for different things if we're buying a bigger quantity um, or doing private label, which is what you're talking about as well. Um, yeah. But, you know, sometimes it's just there's certain things I'm like, okay, there's a time for everything. Um, and for airlines specifically, or ones I just spoke with, um, the price point for them, I think the the quantity of product we would need to be producing to get that price point that low is too large for us right now. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, and I okay. think the moral... Yeah. Yeah, and I think the moral of the story, which you're really highlighting, is that, um, well, two things. Things things change, um, and bigger isn't always better, and it, it's just a decision in the moment depending on the business strategy for today. And, you know, you've talked a lot about capacity, you know, the fact that, you know, you need a supply chain manager, for instance. You're at that next level on the foodpreneur growth journey, basically, where you're, you're growing, you're scaling which is, which is really exciting. So um, actually, I'm going to read a quote to you that I've heard you make um, that I think is phenomenal. Um, women, minorities, foodies. These are all things that are being praised. Crazy, huh? And it's great time to shine. Map out some goals and plans and make things happen. You don't have to have all the answers. Shit, I never do. But just know what you want to do and work towards that. Ask yourself, if I could do anything in this industry and get paid for it, what would it be? Whatever it is, do that shit. You got this. Women are so fearless and strong. So, Ashley, I ask you, what are you going to do next? with Trade Street Jam Company because that is so bloody inspiring and so aligned with my thinking and my values that I actually feel emotional even asking you. What if, what's in store for you and Trade Street Jam Company? Uh, so for me, my, my plan is really to just grow this business as big as I can. Um, I want to see it be a household name. I want to see a black woman-owned business be as big as some of these other brands that you're so used to seeing, right? Your Smuckers and your um, Bon Maman and, you know, all the jams you're used to seeing in your house. I I'm ready for us to start seeing woman-owned and Black-owned brands in our household, right? If you look around in your house today, I guarantee 99% of what you own is by a, a huge organization that is led by a man and likely a white man, right? We need to see women in power. We need to see minorities in power. Um, and so I, I'd love to grow this brand to the size where it's a common name that you're seeing um, and that people know it. And then once I do that, I plan to sell the company and use that money to do other uh, endeavors. You know, I'd love to open a small store. Uh, I'd love like a Sir La Tab or Williams Sonoma type store that has all these fun little kitchen things uh, but I'd love to only have like women and minority owned brands in that in that space I think that would be really cool um, and to you know maybe teach um, some some classes do a master class you know I have all these great things so really my plan is to grow the brand as big as I can and then let somebody take it from there 
Females in food, did you hear that? Trade Street Jam Company. She said it here. This is going to be big. I know it is. You've got the, the smarts and the skill and the talent, Ashley. And so where can people find out more about your, you and your business? So the best place to, to grab some jam for your pantry is to go on our website. Uh, it's tradestreetjamco.com. So it's T-R-A-D-E-S-T-J-A-N-C-O.com. And uh, if you want to check us out on Instagram, you can find us at that same handle at trade S T jam C O. We've got tons of recipes and really fun videos and you get to learn more about uh, the company and the, the founder and you even get to see my little baby on there a little bit. So uh, definitely check us out. Ashley, thank you so much for your time today and all the fantastic information that you've shared. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me.